We thank God for this afternoon. Please, I welcome all of us uh, to Rafael Medical Center. Uh, we organize monthly uh, lectures, Zoom lectures for both our clients and um, our staff and even the, the general public. Uh, our aim is to um, to educate uh, the general public. Um, we we have realized that um, that so many times people come to the hospital and there are certain presentations they come with uh, that you know that if this person has has had some knowledge about it, probably it could have helped in the outcome of the disease. It could have helped the person come to the hospital early enough, or the person could have done some first aid or the other at home. So because of this, uh, we have decided to organize this monthly Zoom lectures. We do various stuff topics. We, we go through all the various uh, disciplines in medicine so that at least we all have some knowledge, of, uh, general knowledge about medicine, general knowledge about health, your body, you should know about your body. So that when something is going wrong, you come early enough and we'll help you early enough. Um, so this, um, this afternoon, we are doing pediatrics, I mean, child health. And I think we've, we've done a, a first lecture um, where we, we spoke about developmental milestones. And this, is, this will be our second lecture in pediatrics. Um, the same pediatrician that we used the other time, she was of immense help and she's going to be with us today. Before I go on, I, let's share a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we are grateful for this afternoon. We thank you so much for this opportunity to learn. We ask in the name of Jesus that, Father, you shall help us, that even we who are going to, Father, or oh listen, Father, you give us knowledge to be able to understand everything. We commit the presenter into your hands, oh God. Even as she's going to facilitate this program, we pray that, Father, oh Lord, you shall help us. Give, give, give her the strength. Give her the knowledge and understanding. Let whatever she talks about be understand understanding to us. May we be able to further oh God, end this um, session successfully and we we'll have a cause to praise and honor you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I said, today we are going, we are Amen. going to do, today we are, we are still going with our pediatric uh, lectures. Uh, we still have our own doctor here with us. Her name is Dr. Dumont. For those of us, uh, those of you who were with us uh, uh, during the other lecture on the developmental milestones, she was the same person who lectured us. Her name is Dr. Evelyn Abina Oponwa Dumont. Uh, she's an award-winning pediatrician, and she's, uh, she has expertise in newborn health. Child, develop, uh, uh, child developmental and then neurodevelopmental disorders, uh, particularly autism spectrum disorders. So today, as I said, we are going to do autism and she is autism specialist. And we will not waste too much time. She, she also uh, sees people, uh, children with attention deficit and then hyperactive disorders. She is the strong advocate for learn the science, act early. When you know the science, you're able to act early, bring your child early for examination, and then your child will at least will be able to diagnose fast and the prognosis will be better. She's married to an amazing husband. Her husband's name is Prof. Koshi Dumont, and she's blessed with three children. She loves cooking and gardening. I wonder how she, she's able to combine that with her practice because she's a very passionate doctor, especially when it comes to uh, autism. She, she, you can see when you talk to her, you can see that everything about autism interests her and she's going to share her knowledge with us. For this session, we are going to do a, a three lectures on autism. We don't want to crowd the lecture so much. We want you to have a, a better understanding of autism. So we are going to have three sessions. So today is the first session. Today we we are just going to, uh, the topic we are going to discuss is what is autism. And then our next session, which will come in December, which will come up in December, we'll do autism, diagnostics, and beyond. And then the third one, uh, we are yet to schedule the dates, but I'm hoping we'll have it done in January. 
that one will, uh, the topic is family educational family and educational challenges and support so um i don't waste much time i'll call on dr dumo to um to give us the lecture but before she comes i want us um if there is anybody who has any question to ask, kindly uh, type it in the chat column and we'll read it at the end of uh, the lectures. Please, because we are going, we have we are dividing the lectures. Please, uh, let's uh, let our questions be only concerning today's lectures. Because if you don't, if you ask beyond today's lectures, maybe your question pertains to the next lecture. So we will not. Uh, we will not answer questions that are not related to today's letter. So that we will not sway, please, let us stick to autism. Let us stick to what is autism today. So that we will not delay so much and then we will not go beyond the topic or we will not sway from the topic. Also, um, I think that the rest will, will talk about it when, when we go from here. So kindly help me welcome Dr. Dumo, even as she gives us our lecture today. Dr. Dumo, please, your people. Thank you so much, Dr. Man Satando. I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, thank you everyone for making time out of your day to, for us to actually talk about autism and, and just to share knowledge together. I see this um, as an opportunity for all of us to learn. I see myself as a lifelong student of autism. There's so much for me to learn. And every day I learn something new. So I'm hoping that I'll be able to share some things with autism, some things on autism with all of you and you'll be able to learn um, just like I am learning. I'm gonna pull up my slide here in a second. All right, can you all hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, yes, thank we you. can hear you. Thank you. Yes, we can hear you. Good. So as Dr. Tana said, this is about autism. This whole series is autism awareness series. Um, the three part series we are going to talk about is what is autism, which is what we are doing today. Then we'll talk about beyond autism diagnosis. So after what you go through to have a diagnosis and what happens after that. And then we'll focus on the family, educational challenges and support, which is so important because it's not enough to know what it is. It's not enough to have a diagnosis, but what else do you do after that? I don't have any disclosures. I do want to acknowledge Rafael Medical Center for this opportunity. Um, I am so grateful that they've, they are willing to partner with me for us to be able to talk about um, things that are very important when it comes to the development of the child. This autism awareness series is dedicated to Hope Setters Autism Center. There's so much that I've learned from them. This center is in Tema. They are trying to make a difference and change the narrative and stories around children with autism. I'll start off by sharing a story that really impacted me. So Julia is a six-year-old who has an older brother who has autism. And when Julia was three years old, she noted that her brother was different. So he, she, she asked her mother one time why her brother was not playing with her like other children that she knew. Her mother turned to Julia and told her, it's because your brother is different. I saw them in clinic one day and the mother was telling me that sometimes when um, her brother has certain type of behaviors and when she's overwhelmed, she doesn't know what to do. And there are many times that she will be there crying. Sometimes she's so frustrated. She doesn't know how to even pull herself together. Julia walks up to her and she taps her mother on the shoulder and she tells her mother, remember, he is different. And she said that she finds so much strength when Julia says that she's able to pull herself together. Interestingly enough, her brother has a bond with her. So her brother is older than Julia by about three years, but he is able to, Julia is able to go to her brother, hold him during periods when he's distressed and the brother will calm down. 
Many a times when we talk about autism, we talk about the story of the child who has autism, the parents, and sometimes the siblings are kind of left out. But Julia's story impacted, impacted me so much because I learned how important it is for everyone around a child who has autism to be part of that child's story. I want to put a question out to all of us. When we hear about autism, what comes to mind? What are the things that we formed, the information, the notions that we have in our minds about autism? Just take a second and think about it. These are some of the things that parents, family members with children with autism think and see when they talk about autism. One mother puts it best. I asked for a blessing and God gave me my child with autism. So we pray and we ask God for our children and we have no um, control over the child that we have. That mother saw her child with autism as a blessing. Another mother puts it out, autism is part of my child. It is not everything he is. He is so much more than a diagnosis. This last one I thought made so much sense. She says, if all you see is autism, 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 you will miss the total person that the person is. So autism, children with autism or people with autism can be silly, they can be bright, they can be fun, they can be loving, they are gifted, they are intelligent, just because they see the world different from the way we see it does not mean that they do not have any potential. When we talk about tracking a child's development in, in the initial series, we have talked about the importance of prenatal to three, which is so critical for brain development. So we talked about how important it is that the first three years of a child's life, parents are present, caregivers are present, and we interact with them because we know that that period builds the foundation for all future learning, behavior, and health. And I want to remind everybody, the first three years of a baby's life, more than 1 million new neuronal brain, so brain connections are forming every second. That's a lot. So that's an important reason why we have to be able to interact. We have to remember that the social, emotional, physical, and cognitive capacities, so brain capacities, development, and intellect, these are built in the first three years, and then later on, they are built on to, to, uh, to make every child become successful, whether in school, in the workplace, and in the larger community. And the relationships and positive experience impact that child's life. By the time a child is five years old, about 90% of that child's brain is developed. This is so important because we are talking about a disorder that affects the brain and how important it is for us to be able to um, come up with early interventions for them. I want to spend a little bit of time and talk about social communication because it's one of the bedrocks of autism. So once we understand social communication, it becomes a little bit easier for us to understand the challenges that children face. So social communication basically is the language which we use in social situations. Um, if you think about the ability to share what you want to say or how you feel appropriately, or um, how to understand and respond to others and what they are saying, that's part of social communication. How we use language to serve different purposes. So if, if I'm saying at the same, uh, oh, you understand what we are saying because we are using language for different purposes. We can use language to say, oh, accommodate me. Um, and people understand what you are saying. The other thing is how we adopt language to meet situations or the needs of other people we are engaging with. So for example, if we are in a place and the place is crowded and we are talking, we raise our voice and we shout, right? We, we try to talk loud enough for the, person, the other person to hear. Um, when we are talking to a child versus we are talking to an adult, we change the way we talk. So we talk to children to meet them at their point and then we talk to adults differently. The other big part of social communication is something we 
simple non-verbal cues. Those are unspoken social rules. So even though I'm not using words, I can still use my body language and gestures and you can understand what I'm saying. So when you see me and I have that smile on my face, you're like, oh, she's happy. Um, when I frown, you are able to tell. When I'm angry, you can tell. When I'm frustrated, you can tell. I don't have to say anything. When I when somebody just throws their hands up in the air, we all know what that means. So that person doesn't have to say it, but then we understand it. The other important thing is to remember that even with all of the social communication differences exist. So depending on the culture that you belong to, and even within cultures and within families, there are differences in the way we communicate. So that um, somebody in who is Ashanti, for example, may say something different from somebody who is Dan. And if something, some justice may be acceptable in that tribe, but it may not be acceptable in one other tribe. Um, you see differences when it comes to how our children communicate with us back home and how they communicate here. So some in some cultures, for example, eye contact is acceptable, whilst in others it is not. I want all of us to look at these pictures. So without even them saying anything, we can look at the pictures and be able to tell that these, these pictures tell a story. They are trying to communicate something. So right there, as early as two months of age, you can see two parents and their baby. And look at how the baby is looking at the father with a smile, with her hand on her chest. She feels secure, she's happy. There's good eye contact. That is social communication. If you look at this other picture where the baby is looking at the father, the father is smiling, the baby is looking at him, he's looking at his head position, so he is actually looking straight at him. Then my favorite is this uh, uh, toddler here who is pointing. If you look at his point, his finger, and you look at his eyes, you can tell that he's looking at something too, and he's pointing to that thing, trying to show something. Um, then you have these two kids here interacting with each other, looking at each other, reaching out and touching each other, right? So these are all forms of social communication. Or the girl who goes, I don't know, uh, and make that expression. We all understand that, even without them using any words. Then you have this baby here who throws the hands up in the air, right? So this is, can you pick me up or I'm all done? Children do that a lot. So social communication is important. It's, it's one of the uh, basic ways that we communicate without even using words sometimes. We can look at that aspect of it and still be able to make our points across. It is important for us to remember that children develop gestures from about nine months to 16 months. And these gestures predict their language ability two years later. Language ability is so important when it comes to preschool, uh, when it comes to academic success, because we know that preschool language skills predict academic, academic success. There's, a, an, uh, there's a, a project called the First West Project here in the US, and they have something called 16 months, uh, by 16 months, 16 gestures that children should be doing. So it's called 16 by 16. And it focuses on 16 gestures with at least two new gestures developed each month between nine and 16 months. And I, I will share that with you. The Don't same way they have another project which talk about 16 actions with objects um, and two new actions with objects each month that children learn from about nine to 16 months. And how children learn to talk, pretend with objects, these things are important when it comes to early imagination. All right, I'm gonna change my screen and then show you what this is before we go on here. So hold on here. Let me pause this for a second. All right, so this is one of the tools that So this is one of the tools that I was talking about. C can everybody hear me still? 
We can hear you. I can hear you, Doc. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So if you look at 16 early signs, um, let's look at this way. This is 16 actions with objects by 16 months. So this talks about the different objects, as you can see. So by nine months, a child should be able to mouth, bang, and drop. And you can see this kid's doing that. Um, it goes on and on, and it talks about 10 months, they can take off and take out. So you put a hat on them, they can take it off. These are simple things that we take for granted, but these are the bedrocks. These build a child's learning as they are learning these different areas. By 11 months, they can push and turn. Um, by 12 months, they can pat and put in. So you can see these kids with these actions. I like these tools because they are picture driven. You can look at it and you'll be able to see, oh, my child is tracking well. My child is doing the things that they are supposed to do. And it goes all the way to 16 months. Now let's get back to my screen. So I have a link onto these if you want to, to take a look at that. So with that understanding, let's talk about what is autism spectrum disorders. So autism spectrum disorder is a disorder which is due to brain differences that affect development. And we see that because it has impacts social communication and these uh, and people who have autism have behavioral challenges. It is important for us to remember they don't look different from other people from the most part. Apart from when a child who has an underlying genetic disorder and has autism as well, most people with autism look the same like us. They do not look any different. They talk, they behave, they relate and react to things differently. Um, sometimes they react differently to people or situations and they learn in different ways, but they are not uh, physically, they may not look different. The development of autism, you start to see the signs before age three years, and it lasts a lifetime. So that's important for us to remember too. It lasts a lifetime, though it may improve. It is important for us to understand that there is no cure, but early and intensive treatments can make a difference, which is why it's so important for us to be able to pick up these signs early. I already talked about the fact that it's a brain disorder. These are different parts of the brain that is affected by autism. And if you look at it, they're like, different parts of our brain does different things. And research has shown that when you compare the brain of a child with autism or a person with autism and a person who does not have autism, there are significant differences, which makes sense as to why they act the way they do. This is so important because this brain mapping is, is providing us with knowledge in terms of how we can help them and target interventions depending on who the child is. When we say spectrum, we are talking about variation in presentation and severity. So children with autism are very different. One child with autism is different from another child with autism. The two are not the same. So they vary in how they show that they have autism and that they, they, how severe their autism symptoms are is also different. Each child has a unique distinct set of strengths and they also have challenges. So um, Ajwa who has autism will have certain strengths from Kofi who has autism, who are, also has certain strengths and certain challenges. And that sometimes can be a, a difficult for a parent because you have to figure out, especially when I have parents who have two or three kids who have autism, each child is so different and they have to figure out their strengths and they have to figure out their challenges. And it's a spectrum. So you can have children who are totally independent in activities of daily living. Like they can talk, they can, um, they can tell you what they need and you know, take Hello, Zulu. you don't have to help them with uh, anything. And then you have children who have difficulties who are totally dependent on other people. So Stephen Shaw, he is a, a professor in, in one of the universities in New York who has autism. And he came up with this. If you've met one child with autism, you've only met one child with autism. 
So the fact that you've seen a child with autism who behaves a certain way doesn't necessarily mean another child will do the same thing. So when it comes to social communication difficulties, right? We, we talk about some of the challenges that children with autism can, or people with autism can have. In that area of social communication, if you go back and look at what I was talking about, the difficulties that they have have to do with how they initiate social interactions and how they respond to it. So for example, um, if you have, if you know someone with autism, for example, sometimes they have difficulty when you are talking to them, they may avoid eye, eye contact. They don't know how to engage in back and forth conversation. So you, you start talking and they may talk and contribute, but they only want to talk about what they are interested in. In addition to that, they don't know how to share things with others. So when a child is playing, for example, and she finds the thing funny and interesting, sometimes they'll bring it and show it to a parent. A child with autism may just give it to a parent because they need help, but not necessarily to show them that, oh, this is something that I enjoy. Now, think of that, sometimes they may have um, difficulty with even reading facial expressions. They, they, they do not understand facial expressions. So if somebody is sad or if another child is crying, their sibling is crying, they may even not necessarily comfort them, whilst a child who does not have autism will be able to do that. Um, they do not always respond when you praise them or you acknowledge them. Those things are kind of difficult for them to do. When it comes to nonverbal communication, we talked about how we use different gestures to communicate. So sometimes children with autism may even have difficulty with um, little things like hi, bye-bye, shaking their head, uh, yes or um, shaking head no or yes. Um, if they want to be picked up, even reaching up can be a problem sometimes. Um, just body gestures, pointing to show something. So you, you see um, a car, a huge car passing by and you point and like, oh, I feel look. And they do not understand that. So they may look, but they are looking at your finger or they may not necessarily look in the direction that you are talking about. Um, in addition to that, they have problems with social awareness, understanding and building social relationships. So they, they just have difficulty when they are playing with their friends. You, they may just sit by themselves and play alone. They may not engage. They may not recognize other children. Um, at this, at, at about 18 months of age, children can take a doll and feed a doll. Uh, children with autism may have difficulty doing that. So here, when you look at this picture of this baby, and um, his brother, you can see that the, both of them are enjoying, they are sharing, they, she's smiling, she's reaching out, she's touching, her brother has covered his face. Um, they are definitely having fun. This is shared enjoyment. And then you look at this, the next picture where the girl is sitting by herself, even though this one is crying, she doesn't really acknowledge the fact that she is and he's, she's engaged in what she is doing. Another big part of autism, so we talked about two areas, social communication and then behavior challenges. Some of the behavior challenges shows up in different ways. So there is an area we call motor mannerisms or atypical talk and play. Sometimes children with autism, when they have toys that they are playing with, instead of playing with the toys, like if you have two cars, um, a child is playing, a boy is playing with cars or a child is playing with cars, for example, they'll bring the cars together, they'll pass the cars, they make so much noises, um, sounds. Children with autism may just line the toys. So I have seen different ones where they line all the cars or if let's say there's a pencil, crayon, whatever other objects they have, they line it all together in a straight line and it's in a perfect straight line. And if you try to mess with it, they just, they, 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 they start to show signs of emotional distress. And sometimes the way they talk, so they talk, but then the talk may be, ooh, or they may have pitches changing in pitches, or they have their own jargons that they've created. So they are talking, but then they are using these jargons, which are really not words, but they say it in repetitive ways. So they may say three things at the same time. 
or four things at the same time. Or you say something and then they echo it back. So I, I saw a child the other day and I, I was asking, oh, how are you? And so I mentioned her name, for example, Ajoa, how are you? And the child responds, Ajoa, how are you? You know, there is no understanding of that the, the question was for her specifically. So she's even referring to herself in the third person. Um, or she she just say something repetitive, like a, a phrase that they've learned from Dora or a show that they like, and they just kind of say it out of the blue. I have a child who um, I take care of that is um, likes the head, shoulders, knees, and toes. So the mother was telling me every time they show a commercial on TV and he hears the word shoulder, he just breaks out in head, shoulders, knees, and toes, head, shoulders, knees, and he would do it repetitively. Or uh, there's one who, when something falls, he will start, London Bridge is falling down, London Bridge is falling down, London Bridge is falling down, and he'll go through the whole routine. So sometimes they have atypical talk and play. Motor mannerisms has to do with movements that they make. So they can have different movements. They can have finger, tw uh, finger twisting, ringing, flapping. Um, sometimes they move their fingers to specific things, tap. They do different things with their movement. Sometimes they rock back and forth. They can spin in circles um, and do that repetitively. Um, other times they, they, they just do odd motor movement. So I have a little video uh, where a dad who has a child, this child has very severe autism, but the dad was able to capture different motor mannerisms that the child was doing in about a minute. So I'm gonna show you how that uh, how that looks. Not every child with autism will do all of it, but um, he captures some of the different things. And I've seen different ones um, that children do. Um, so I'll just pause and then have um, Emmanuel show us the video. Imano, we don't need the sound, we just need the, the videos. So the father talks about it as stimming, but he's just gonna show us the different things that this girl does. And he does a good job. He actually labels the different ones so that you can pick it up. And this is from YouTube, so. Look at the child's fingers. Thank you. So I'm gonna go back to my screen. So that's a, those are examples of motor mannerisms that um, children with autism can do. It does, they don't have to do all of it, um, but you see that they do these abnormal uh, movements or I would say abnormal, atypical movements that we see. The second behavior challenge that they have is that they can have a lot of rigidity and 
they like to stick with rituals. So I have kids where, for example, if their bedtime routine is such that you go from, you take a shower, you brush your teeth, you put on your pajamas, and then you go, you read a story, and then you go to bed. They want it like that every single day. They do not want change in it. If they wake up in the morning, for example, they drink a cup of milk before they brush their teeth. You can't switch and say, let's brush our teeth before we drink a cup of milk. They're very rigid and they like to stick with that. And you see that also when it comes to the, the food that they eat. They, they just want to eat certain types of food and that's it. So if it's something, if they eat uh, sandwiches, they can eat sandwiches every single day the same way the sandwich has to be made the same way and has to have the same taste. They are, I have kids that are able to even recognize when the parents take a different route to go to the store. Well, why didn't we take this route, especially when they can communicate? They like that, they like for their things to be done the same way all the time. And then they can have preoccupations with objects and toys. So they can hyper focus and be interested in certain types of toys, for example, um, certain objects like the ceiling fan. They can watch the ceiling fan on and on. They can turn light switches on and off. They are fascinated with the lights turning on and off. They may love um, strings and they, they like to move the strings. Um, they will want water want drip. Um, I have kids that love, uh, they so focus on what, fixate on water to the extent that they can even go to the, the bathroom just to play with the water in the toilet bowl. So it is important for us to, to, to look at some of that so they can have preoccupations with objects and, top, and, and then topics. So topics, you can have a child who is interested in say, Dora the Explorer. That is all they want to watch. They will watch Dora, they can go through the scenes of Dora, there are certain specific areas and they can watch Dora 20 times a day. Um, I have a child who loves Peppa Pig and he watches Peppa Pig all the time, over and over. And this child can switch from his American accent to British accent and talk to you um, with a British accent using some of the lines from Peppa Pig. Then they can have sensory challenges. So they peer at things, they, they visually look and inspect things. Sometimes they'll put their head down and look at it closely. They flip over um, toys, look at the wheels of a car, for example, and examine them closely. Or they may have difficulty with noises. So, <clears throat> excuse me, so they don't like setting noises, especially loud noises. Some of the kids will cover their ears when there's a loud noise, they get startled, they are in distress um, because of that. They have certain textures that they like. Um, so some kids, for example, may like something which is soft and smooth. They want to have that. Um, they don't like anything which is rough. Even with their food, they can have different textures that they like. They like things that are crunchy, but they don't like certain things. And then they may lick, sniff things. They may smell things um, before they eat things. I have a child who is very particular with how foods are put together, you know, so those are some of the areas they can, they like, I have a child who has like, like tight spaces. <clears throat> so at home, she likes to stay in corners, for example. Um, so they have all these sensory challenges, anything which is tight, she feels comfortable. Um, sometimes they have high pain tolerance. So when they fall and they get hurt, um, they may not cry. Something that you expect a child his age to cry, they will not. And they do not seek comfort either. So these are some of the sensory things that, that you see. So to cap it, to recap it, remember that there are two main areas of challenges, social communication and behavior challenges. Hold on, I think I lost my, good. So now let's talk about what causes autism spectrum disorder. The, there is a lot of research which is going on in this area. We know that there are certain genes that runs in families and these genes make one uh, family more likely to have a child with autism compared to another. And then there are, uh, your genes basically are, are the units that we have in our body that makes us who you are. So how you, you look and, and all of that, you can, those are, the genes play an important role in that. 
there are um, there's research which is telling us that there are certain genetic disorders. So certain changes goes on in these genes, and then these changes result in a child having autism. So we talk about gene mutations. They are basically changes. Sometimes you have missing parts of a gene, or you have genes that are duplicated. It can be a single gene, or it can be multiple genes. And these genes that affect brain development, when they change, they, they affect the way the brain develops or the way the brain cells communicate. So there's one area of genes and what genes do and how they contribute to the cause of autism. Another area that is being looked at is something we call environmental. So things like people are looking at viral infections, medications that were taken during pregnancy or complications of pregnancy, heavy metals like mercury, lead, air pollutants, whether all of these things interact with the genes to make a child, uh, to make um, a parent have a child who has autism. And then there's a big area that we do not know. There's so much research which is going on in autism at this point. There's so much that we don't know, but these are some of the things that we know. The other thing is that there are certain things we call risk factors. So we've noted that boys, for example, are, tend to have autism more than girls. And then when it comes to family history, if you have somebody in the family who has autism, they can have another child who has autism. Um, babies that are extremely premature who survive, they a little bit of an increased risk of autism. Or if you give birth when you are very, very old, you also have a risk factor for getting autism. It doesn't mean that every one of them will, but we see a certain pattern when it comes to children with autism. On this list, we do not see anything which says witchcraft or demons or um, your relative is the cause of it necessarily. Um, so I think it's important for us to remember that autism is a condition, medical condition, just like other different types of medical conditions. The only difference is that this is a brain disorder. I want to talk about autism and vaccines because that's another area that there's a lot of controversy. Multiple research shows us that there is no link between autism and vaccines. Most recently research in 2019, there was a research that looked at over 600,000 kids that were studied over 11 years and there was no connection between vaccines and autism. So it's important for us to remember this whole thing started from a doctor who did a study in 1998, which involved the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine in 12 children. His research has been debunked because one, the, the methods that were used was not um, appropriate, and it was also sponsored by a group of people who did not want to have vaccines. They looked at the, the positive thing, I think, that has come out from that whole um, autism and vaccine look is that now we have vaccines that do not have um, heavy metals. So mercury used to be a component, a certain specific type of mercury used to be a component of vaccines, and that was used to prevent contamination, especially mm -hmm. when you have one vaccine that you can use over and over and over and give it to different people. But now we don't have that anymore. Now, what should caregivers watch for? This is really what is the important part about this discussion. We know what autism is. We understand that they have challenges when it comes to social communication and they have challenges with behaviors. But as a parent, what am I supposed to watch for? As a grandmother, what am I supposed to watch for? Um, so sometimes it may look confusing. The puzzle may look messy to you, but it makes sense to, to a child who has autism. Research tells us that 30% of parents are able to see by the time their child is one year old that there is some devel development differences between that child and other kids. By the child time the child is two years, 80 to 90 percent of parents can definitely tell that there is some developmental problems going on with their child. For me as a doctor, what I have learned from this is that it's important for me to listen to my parents. So when my parents comes and has a concern about their child's development, because parents are specialists when it comes to their kids, it allows me to listen and be able to address their concerns adequately. Yeah. Yeah. Signs of autism. 
So these are some of the little tips that you can look at. If by six months, a child doesn't respond with a smile or happy expression. So for those of us who, ha who have kids, you know that when your child is about four, four to six months, you smile, they smile back. You smile, they smile back. They give you that back and forth response. You change the facial expression to smile and happy and they do the same thing. By nine months, children are mimicking sounds or facial expressions. So you, you, you have a child put their tongue just because you did it. Um, you, you change it, you're looking at them and then you change your facial expression, they'll also change it. So if by nine months a child is not mimicking sounds or facial expressions, that is a developmental concern. If a child is not bubbling or responding to their name by 12 months. So if you call Kojo, he's in his own world doing something. He doesn't listen. Kojo, you literally have to move and look at him and turn to look at him. That's a developmental concern. We talked about the importance of gestures. If that child is not pointing or waving at 14 months, that's also a concern that, okay, this could possibly be that there could be something going on with brain development. If a child is not saying single words by 16 months, most kids can, they'll be able to say, well, mommy, we're here, or call, bra. Sim single words, most kids will be able to say that. So if by 16 months, a child is not saying any words, that's something that can be of concern. Then don't play make believe or pretend by 18 months. As I said, most children at that age, they can take a doll, they can feed a doll, they, they will comfort the doll, they will put the doll to bed. Those are all areas where we have to remember if a child is not doing any of that, that can be an area of concern. And then if they are not putting two words together um, by 24 months. So if by two years, your child is not saying anything other than three words or, um, doesn't have enough words, that can also be of concern. So the last area that I want us to remember when it comes to early signs of autism is the loss of language skills or any social skills that they developed before. So we know that sometimes children with autism will show their signs of autism right from the beginning, but children with autism can also develop normally. And then by the time they get to about 18, um, you know, 12 to 18 months, somewhere there, you start to see that they've lost some of the skills that they've acquired. So it's important as a parent, when you notice that a child is losing certain skills to be able to reach out for help. So these are some of the early signs of autism. I'm gonna pull here um, another flyer, which I think is so um, important and easy for parents to look at. Sixteen early signs of autism by sixteen months. This is a tool that I share with my parents a lot. Um, it's I, I've provided the link so you can look at it. But it talks about how babies are natural es es explorers, right? And how babies are drawn to look at people and interact. We are human beings. We are social beings. And there's a lot of research which is telling us that even from about nine months of age, you can begin to pick up if a child has autism. Unfortunately, for most people. Autism diagnostics is not made until the child is older. And in our part of the world, I think the research says that um, children are not diagnosed with autism until they're about eight years of age. Um, here it's about four years, sometimes a little bit earlier. So this flyer here talks about some of the signs of autism that you can watch for. And it goes through 16 signs, um, how to get your baby to look at you, uh, rarely shares enjoyment with you really shares their interest with you. So that child is just doing what they are doing. They are not interested in sharing it with anybody else. They really <coughs> respond to their name. You call and call and call and the child is tuned in somewhere else, does not respond to their name. Um, limited use of gestures such as show and point. Show and point, so gestures <coughs> are so fundamental for the development of social communication. So if a child is not doing that, that is something for us to show some concern. So limited use of gestures, especially showing and pointing. And if it's hard for your baby to look at you and use a gesture and sound all at the same time, this can be an early sign of autism. So when we don't just point, I point and I look. And if I want to show something to my parents, I look at my mom, I 
look at what I'm thinking. Then I look back to my mother. It's important, right? Coordination of those three things is important when it comes to um, social communication. So if a child is not doing that, that could be a sign of autism. And then if they are not imitating people or pretending, so it kind of shows that as well. We talked about that. Use your hand as a tool. Um, most of the time, if a child has difficulty doing something, uh, if they're trying to open and they can't open it, they just give it to um, a, a, an adult or somebody to help them. They give it to the person and they will tell you, they will either point and tell you and looking at you and tell you to do it. Children with autism may give you that, but they will not show any indication that they want you to do anything. So they just give. Or they may pick your hand. Instead of interacting and looking at you, they will just take your hand to do that action. So they may take your hand to point. They may take your hand to open the jar. They may take your hand to, to do something else. They want to reach for something and you are sitting there. They'll use you as a ladder and climb over you to get to it. So they are not really engaging with you. They are just using you as a tool. And then when you have a child who is more interested in objects than people, so there are a group of kids that we are all playing together and that particular child is just by himself, picked up one toy, flipped the toy, looking at the toy instead of interacting with the other kids. We talked about unusual moving of their fingers and hands, which that video shows, shows that, that that video of that child shows different ones. And then repeats unusual movements with objects. If they do the same thing with the object over and over and over. Um, sometimes they don't even know the function of the object. They are just using it. So instead of it, he knowing that this is a car and crashing the car and playing with the car and making car noises, that child may just look at the car. So if you look at this child here, just look at the, he's lined up the car, she's looking at the wheels. He's really not engaging and interacting with it. And then the rituals, we talked about that, excessive interest in particular objects or activities. And sometimes those objects are not even objects that children will really play with. So they may be focused or attached to an unusual object. And we talk about water, sticks, rocks, um, strips, cloth. I have a child who comes and he'll be holding, holding a string and he just wants to like move the string back and forth. So these are some of the 16 signs, early signs of autism. And you will have a link to this as well. I think that this is such a great tool. I use it for my parents and you know, my, in my practice all the time. All right, so let's get back to our screen. Okay, so red flags for autism, what every parent should know, in addition to the 16 early signs that we talked about, avoid eye contact and want to be alone. Or they may have eye contact, but it's such a fleeting eye contact. So they'll look at you for a second and then they've moved on. You call them, they'll turn, look at you for a second and then they move on. Delay speech and language skills. Repeat words or phrases over and over again. Um, you ask a question and then they start talking about something totally different. Um, saying you instead of I. So instead of referring to themselves, they refer to themselves in a third person. Have trouble understanding other people's feelings. They do not understand personal space or boundaries. So I had a, a, a four-year-old the other day um, that I was evaluating for autism and I was wearing an autism shirt which had fingerprints on there. And this child just can walk straight to me and put her hands on all the fingerprints on my chest. And she just says, hands, 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 hands. She wasn't even engaging with me. She didn't even understand personal space or boundaries. Um, not comforted during distress. So when they are distressed and you're trying to comfort them, it makes it worse. Sometimes they have flat inappropriate facial expressions. Remember we talked about flapping, rocking body, spinning in circles, um, the voice with which they talk or the repetitive nature, lining up toys. Uh, they get upset by minor changes. They like routine and structure and they want to stick with that rigidity. Um, following certain routines, like you have to do the same way, playing with toys the same way every time, parts of objects that they, they play with, like the wheels of a car so they can spin it, um, obsessive interest, fan stones, stick, water mirrors, we talked about that, unusual reactions to sound and smell and taste or things that how they look or feel, so clothing, um, loud noises, um, things like that.
So these are some of the resources that um, if you want to have some information, you can kind of go and look at. I have the links for all the 16 actions, 16 by 16 actions. I also have a link on, um, based on the last developmental milestone, we talked about uh, what to watch for, tracking your child's development, learn the science, act early. There's a screening tool called Modified Checklist for Autism in Toddlers, which is from about 16 months to 30 months. And it's, it's, it's pretty easy uh, screen that parents can fill out if they have concerns. And if there are some concerns, you can reach out to your doctor. And then I have the early signs of autism here as well. In conclusion, I want us to remember, when I look at autism, I look at it this way. It is astonishing in the sense that children who have autism that I have seen surprise me all the time with their skills, their talent, and yet they have difficulties and challenges. They can put a, a complex puzzle together and yet they can, they have difficulty with simple things such as asking for help. They are unique, they are not the same. They have different talents, they have different strengths. Um, all of these astonishing unique talents are intersecting with special challenges that they have. And it's up to us to be able to understand the messages and the communication, what they are trying to portray to us or what they are trying to communicate with us. So I look at autism this way. Um, so not just from a place of challenges, but also from a place of strength. <coughs> I want us to remember that kindness is a language <coughs> autism feel and understand. So just because a child has autism and they cannot communicate, does not mean that they do not understand kindness. They do not feel kindness. And that's why you, Julia's story comes in. You can tell that his brother can feel his sister's kindness. I think yesterday was World Kindness Day. I just want all of us to remember and be kind when we meet somebody who has special needs because they understand when we show them kindness. Thank you so much. And then I'll pause for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Jumo. Uh, your lecture was really insightful. I have learned a lot today. I hope uh, my other colleagues have also really learned a lot. There are some few questions, uh, I'll put them across and then we'll try as much as possible to finish them on time. Uh, please, for us, if there is any more question, kindly put it in the chat column. Uh, try as much as possible to stay within uh, to stay within the, uh, the the lecture today. Don't go beyond this because we have the other two lectures that we're going to do in December and probably in January. So the first question, um, please, what's the least age one can start noticing the signs of autism? Please, what is the least age one can start noticing? So that is a really good question. Um, if you look at the, the slide where we talked about the early signs, right? We talked about parents, some <coughs> parents have talked about from about six to nine months, they can tell that their child is different. And, and so it is important for us to be able to look at those signs. However, <coughs> children develop a child's development is, is variable, right? So we don't have um, children all develop at the same time and at the same rate. So it is important for us to remember that mm. when we are putting it in context. So just because your six month old did not smile when you smile doesn't necessarily mean your six month old has autism. It's definitely something for you to track, but it's important for you to know that other things come into contact. It cannot just be that one thing. I know that there's um, as early as nine months of age, um, some parents have been able to notice signs and their children have been evaluated. For the most part, most kids are somewhere picked between 18 to 24 months of age. Okay. So Thank when you, you notice much. the signs, the, the signs mm -hmm. that your child is showing or exhibiting, that's a good time for you to pay close attention. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Uh, the next question, uh, please, before I go to the next question, let's all try, apart from Dr. Dumo, let's all try to mute, uh, uh, to, to be on mute so that uh, we don't get uh, noise coming from different 
goes. Thank you. The next question are the cause of autism, such as poor self during delivery, which may affect the, uh, the baby's fragile brain since it's a neurodevelopmental disorder. Uh, the number uh, second is prolonged labor, which may lead to oxygen deprivation to the brain during delivery. Um, uh, the person is trying to ask whether there is yes. any link to yes. I think so. I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. Excuse me. I think it makes a lot of sense because if you if we are talking about something that affects brain development, then lack of oxygen can mm. be a problem. Um, so we have some yeah. children who have autism and had, uh, there were some difficulties around delivery and around pregnancy. Mm -hmm. um, there's talk about diabetes. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Mary, for, um, I think there was uh, somebody actually put down complications during pregnancy or delivery, such yeah. as gestational diabetes, high blood pressure, abnormal bleeding, and low birth weight. So we talked about extremely low birth mm -hmm. weight as a risk factor, right? So we know that these risk factors mm -hmm. exist. Um, and so it is so important for us to, to put that in perspective. Mm -hmm. um, pregnancy is such a, a it's a whole process. Um, delivery itself mm -hmm. is a whole process. There is the belief that these environmental factors interact with genetic factors and that predisposes a child to get an autism. Okay, thank you. So what's about, um, do nonverbal communicators ever talk? That is such a good question. I think that nonverbal communicators could talk, but they talk in different ways. So um, mm. some of them, I have kids who never said a word till they were four or five years of age before they started talking. Um, however, I also have children mm. with, with autism who do not talk at all. They may use other ways to communicate, mm. th but they do not use language in terms of using words. And that's why it's important for us to remember that this is a spectrum. So you can have a child who does not talk from the beginning with intervention, start to talk, mm. and then that child may lose talking and um, uh, start to talk and may continue to talk. And then you may have another child where you will do all of these interventions too. But they do not talking as we know it, but they may talk in other ways. There are children that are able to use something we call augmentation, uh, augmented communication devices, and they are able to talk that way. Mm. Use picture exchange communication mm. system, like pictures, mm. visual tools as well. I think it's important for us to look at it and remember, if you know a child mm -hmm. with autism, you only know one. So that child is unique and has their own, mm. um, their own way of communication. It is very mm -hmm. hard when you have a system of talking, which doesn't necessarily correlate with how everybody else typically talks around you. Okay. Uh, somebody is asking a question about uh, any evidence-based evidence um, treatment or uh, intervention, but I don't know whether we'll discuss it now or we'll push yeah, it so to the other So we're going to talk about that when we talk about family support. Um, but there's a lot of evidence-based yeah. interventions for managing behavior. So remember that autism is lifelong. Autism is not like a curable. It's not like I have malaria, I take anti-malaria and then it goes away. Um, autism, like high blood pressure or, mm. you know, or like a child who has type 1 diabetes stays with the child. However, there are interventions that helps to improve some of the difficulties they have when it comes to communication or some of the behaviors. But we'll, we'll delve into detail when we talk about um, family educational support and, and, and it, it's some other interventions in that particular one, but um, there are evidence-based treatments to help. And then also you have to remember that children with autism can also have different, um, can also have different I lost my train of thought for a second because somebody typed in something. Um, we also have to remember that children with autism can respond to different interventions. So one intervention may not necessarily uh, okay. work for one, but it may work for another child. That's, this is where we talk about the genes and the differences and the fact that it's a spectrum, right? So it also depends mm. on whether you are showing mild symptoms, moderate symptoms, severe symptoms. It all kind of ties in together. And then when it comes to interventions, children with autism can also have different um, 
something we call comorbidities. We'll talk about in our next lecture. Mm. And some interventions in okay. those areas can be helpful. Okay. Thank you very much. I there are some there's another question. I think it's also for Anyway, let me read this one now. Is autism specific to each individual? Probably you've answered that question, but yes. if you can. Is it specific to each individual? So we talked about the uniqueness and the differences, right? So we have to remember mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. yeah. um, it's, it's not, it's, it's, so there's the general broad theme of the challenges they face when it comes to social communication and behaviors, challenges with behaviors. However, there's the uniqueness of it in the sense that um, one child with autism may have this skill, another child with autism may not have that skill. So we have people with autism, mm -hmm. like one of the famous people with autism is the guy who developed Pokemon, the game Pokemon. So you look at this mm. person who is limited and restricted. He, when he was young, they used to tease him and call him Mr. Bug because he was fascinated with it. Yet he is able to to, mm. to develop and come up with this creation, which everybody in the world knows about. And then you also have mm. um, children who have autism who are limited in so many different ways. So you, 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 even with their limitations, they still have strengths, they may have challenges, but they still have strengths and they still have certain abilities. So I think it's important for us to remember that just because your child has autism does not mean that that child cannot reach their potential. That child can reach the potential for that child. That child's potential may not be the same as Hofi's potential because there are children, there are people with autism who are working in the computer world. They, especially in, a, in a, they, they have skills such that they are able to use some of their challenges effectively. Um, there's, a, an, I, there's a, a documentary that I watched recently where I was talking about tech companies like Microsoft, Google, SAP. All these people are beginning to realize that when because children with autism can pay attention to detail and they can do things repetitive, they are some of the best employees that they have because they give them a task and they are able to accomplish that task. So it's important for us to remember mm. that the fact that a child has autism doesn't mean that that child doesn't have potential. No, okay. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Dumo. Uh, I, I'll ask one last question. Uh, please, this, this is from me. Uh, I wanted to know whether uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome or uh, can you have any effect, let's say a child, uh, a child happened to be around when the mother was raped or when the mother was killed, can such a child develop autism in the future? So if you, if you look back at the slide where we talked about um, the prenatal to three year period, which is so critical when it comes to a child's development, right? We, there is a whole science mm. which mm. is talking about adverse childhood experiences and how that impacts a child's mm. development. So not okay. all mothers who were raped and had a child will develop autism. That child may develop autism for mm. some other reason. Um, but we know that adverse okay. childhood experiences can impact a child for, um, impact a person for a very a, a long time. So it's important for us to remember as we are, uh, talking about these things that in the core, in, in when we talked about the environmental factors, and remember that this is an evolving science. So new stuff is coming up all the time. Mm. Um, there is really no um, specific science which says that when a mom is raped or when there's some trauma, that can affect it. But we know that for the health of um, a baby, for example, the mom's health plays mm. an important role in that baby's mm. life. Yeah, so it's important for us to okay. remember um, that when we are thinking about it. So it's not necessarily that, but there are so many factors that come into contact, that interact, that leads okay. to it. Thank, thank you. Thank you very, very much. I think Mary sent a message, that's for you, so I'm not going to read that. Um, I think well, that's all for uh, We are very grateful to you today. It's been 
I, I want to especially thank our, our, our participants also. We've had quite a number of people, and I hope we've all been able to learn as I have learned today. Um, as, as we, I said from the beginning, this is the first of a three series uh, autism study that we are doing. So uh, today is the first one. And uh, in December, we're going to have the second one. The dates will be communicated to all of us uh, through the various channels that we have. I think uh, our Facebook, uh, our IT people will put up uh, our channels. So we are on Facebook, we are on Instagram, and we are on YouTube. And uh, kindly note that all these lectures will, uh, uh, will put it on our pages, both on Facebook. Currently, we are on Facebook Live, but we'll have uh, the whole lecture on our YouTube page. And I think it has been there. The link has been posted to the chat column, so you can actually go and watch again, and also you can share with other people. You can also tell, talk to uh, other people about our lectures. We have monthly lectures. For these three, the sub, uh, three subsequent months, we are going to dedicate it to autism, autism spectrum disorders, and then after that, we'll also open up for other topics also. And so uh, feel free to join us every time. As you know, this is Rafael Medical Center. Um, uh, we, in fact, uh, we are a multi-specialist hospital in Tema Community 10. We have um, another branch in Tema Community 1. Tema Community 1, we, uh, we take the national health insurance uh, and all other insurances. Uh, for the Community 10 branch, we don't take the national health insurance, but we take other private insurances. You can come to us anytime. If you're a private patient, we also will open our arms to you. Every discipline in medicine, I think when you come, you'll be able to, um, you, 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 you will, be, will be of service to you. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you, we are great. You're welcome. We'll have a good day. It's still a good day. Please bear in mind that we'll have our subsequent lectures. We will communicate to you be ready to be with us and listen. Lovely. Dr. Duma, sorry, I forgot to say God richly bless you. God bless you. It's been awesome today. We are grateful. Amen.